Welcome again, everyone, to the Lord Christian Church service. I thank you all that are here for joining us, and I thank you all that will be watching this online either tomorrow or at a later date. I have a few announcements. There's a slight change of how we're doing the Lord's Supper next week. Um, I was able to actually get some pre-made communion cups with a wafer comes in it that is supposed to be here or supposed to be delivered to us today. Wednesday. Today. Today. Yeah. Actually, they're coming today, Jen says. So if they don't come, I'll let you know. Otherwise, plan on just showing up. I think we're just going to put them on a table and separate them early so you come in and grab one. Um, if you still want to bring your own elements, that's fine too. Whatever you feel more comfortable with. But that's how we'll be celebrating Lord's Supper next week on Saturday and Sunday. Um, the only other thing I have is we're still doing all our online studies this week. And the men's group on Tuesday night, we meet in a parking lot. If possible, if not, we're probably going to start meeting in the sanctuary. Um, and keep our distance there. And the Wednesday night group will also be on Zoom this week at 6.30. And the Friday night group will be on Zoom this week at 7. And for those of you that are able to join, um, Andy's doing a really great job on our Sunday, Sunday school. Uh, going through the book, What is the Heart of the Church? Or maybe it's called The Heart of the Church. But either way, Andy's leading that. Um, and that's, we moved that back to 11.15. On Sundays is to give people a chance to get home after the service on Sunday. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Does anybody have anything that is here? Well, I Our call of worship today is Psalm 68, verses 19 through 20. May the Lord be praised. Day after day, He bears our burdens. God is our salvation. God is a God of salvation, and escape from death belongs to the Lord. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will Marvelous, infinite, matchless 
reason I can be here today, he just called me, so I will lead us in our invocational prayer, and then we will go right into our praise and prayer time. Father, again, I just thank you that we are able to gather here, Lord. Um, I know that we are all caught up into the great cloud of witnesses, Lord, that it's just an amazing thing, no matter how big our group or how small our group, that we are caught up with our the saints that have gone before, and we get to worship with you around your throne at this very moment. Help us never to lose sight of that, just that awe that we should have of that, Lord, that amazingness. And I just thank you for that, Lord. I pray that you would just bless this service, that you be with everyone that is here, that you be with everyone that may watch this online later. Lord, I thank you for, the again, this medium that you've given us to uh, send out your word to the via the World Wide Web. I pray that you use it for your glory, Lord. Obviously, there are a lot of things on the web that won't be used for your glory, but I pray that you use this for your glory. Again, I just thank you for all that are here. We lift up those that were unable to make it today and those that may not be unable to make it tomorrow, that you would continue to be with them. Let us um, continue to worship you no matter where we're gathered at this time. And again, we long for the time when it's in your will that we will all be together again, together again as one body, worshiping you as our one Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. I have a couple of praises I'd like to mention um, before I open up the floor to others. I'd like to read a little bit of a letter, an update Jen and I get from Samaritan's Purse, just on what is actually going on out there, what they're experiencing. Um, this is actually from when they had their field hospital in Italy. I'll read it to you. A man named Francesco came to our emergency field hospital in critical condition. He was unable to breathe on his own, on his own and required a ventilator to keep him alive. As the medical staff cared for him, they prayed for him and showed him the compassion of Christ. His condition steadily improved. He he wept when the medical staff was finally able to tell him he was out of danger. Most importantly, Francesco saw something different about the care that he received from our team. Because of that, God opened the door for him to hear the gospel, and he prayed to receive Christ as his Lord, as his Lord and Savior. He said, I am the living proof that prayer works and that Jesus saves. Also, that was in Italy, Northern Italy, when they had to build a hospital here, there. Here's a story from um, what happened to one person in New York when they had their field hospital there. And by the way, the city of New York, you didn't see this on the news, surrounded them with love. Kids were painting stuff, putting on their fences, restaurants were bringing in food. People were very thankful that they were there. Some of the people in the government were not because of their stance on marriage, but for the most part, they were surrounded with love and thankfulness. There was a man that says, his name is, I don't have his name, but basically, this man was dying, he was turning blue, and the doctor that saw it at first came over to him, they surrounded him, did what they needed to do medically, and the doctor just started praying, he's like, God, don't let this guy die. And he told the guy not to give up, not to give up. And through that, the doctor, he said, put his hand on his chest, started praying for him. And he felt the peace he's never felt before. He ended up living, accepting Christ. And it's the same thing. They witnessed to these people with the care they needed medically. The care they needed medically. But they did not shy away from proclaiming Christ and sharing the gospel. And this guy was, he was on his way out. And God miraculously saved him through Samaritan's Purse. And there's many more stories like that. Um, that the people were saved. And some people were asking the nurses, why are you here? Why did you come to New York City? Put yourself at risk for us. And they got to share Christ's love with them. That's just the praise I have. Another praise... It's just um, just continuing that we are still gathering as a church, either via the internet at this time, and I understand that some that don't want to come at this time until they feel safer, it's perfectly okay. 
We're also gathering on Zoom. We're going to start gathering for our Bible studies in person soon. That's a phrase. But just also just be continuing prayer for our government officials during this time. That God will give them wisdom. And that we will also pray for those, especially within the body of Christ, that will have patience in this. Because God has ordained this. Let us, His will be done, however, this, however long this thing is going to last. And it is still out there. I mean, it is beautiful weather. Um, Number-wise, not that many people are dying, but it is still out there. So I just continue to be conscious of where we're at and what we're doing with our neighbors so we can love them. Um, does anybody else have a praise or a prayer request? Michelle. Um, I praise God that however many years now it's been, there was a first Pentecost. And that's the, the red vestments on the um, communion table signify that mm -hmm. the apostles and those gathered in that room, they had tongues of fire came on to them. That was the mode God decided to use indwell them with the Holy Spirit. And I just like to think about it because that same power lives in me and every believer. And so I'm glad to see the vestments there. It's a good reminder. Yes, Michelle just reminded those of you maybe online did not hear that um, this is the Sunday we celebrate the first Pentecost. And it's this amazing thing that she said that God chose to send His Spirit in that way. And all believers today have that same Spirit. And God himself chooses to dwell within us, which is an amazing thing. And then read the book of Acts. <laughs> when the Spirit came, that's when Peter got boldness for the first time in his life. To proclaim the gospel to others. And then the Spirit moved again when it went to the Samaritans. And then moved again when God was showing that he was saving the Gentiles. And it fulfilled its mission of giving us the New Testament and the final word. But yes, the day is the day we celebrate Pentecost. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Michelle. I think a lot of people within the church get confused of what that actually happened then and what's happening today. Basically because they have a low view of Pentecost. That is when God sent His Spirit to indwell in believers. All believers get His Spirit equally. And it is a beautiful thing. So, any other praises or prayer requests? Again, I would, as we've said many times, ask, continue to ask for prayer for those that may be struggling financially because of this. Um, we have not received that many calls from help here at the church, so if anybody knows anybody, obviously tell us. Um, it, it seems like God is providing for people's needs, but I pray that we will continue to just be aware of our neighbors if they need help. I know a lot within the body of Christ here in this local body and help people that have been in need out of their own graciousness. We continue to lift that up, but let us pray that also when we help people with their physical needs, that will not be our main goal. That we would share the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Yes, Michelle. I have a prayer request. My brother-in-law is a police officer in Columbus. Um, obviously, it's not a great time for that, but I'm grateful that he does serve and has served and for us to remember that, you know, there's people going to work every day doing things that we would never do. Um, so just, just that, and that he, God would speak to him about himself while he's doing that. Yep. Michelle says she has a brother-in-law that's a police officer in Columbus who remembers them at this time and obviously the city of Minneapolis um, that the Gospel-believing churches there will have a, a avenue now to share with those that are just, it's, it's out of control right now, honestly. It is out of control, and the city is being burned. And the last thing I looked into is we need to be praying for Minneapolis, for people's safety, and also uh, if, uh, the message of the gospel will go forth at this time. So anybody else have a praise or a prayer? All right, let's again go to the throne of grace. Father, again, I just praise you and thank you for who you are. Again, I just um, lift up all these prayer requests that were mentioned here within this 
body that you have gathered on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Lord, I just personally thank you for the weather that you've given us on this day, Lord. Whether it rains or it shines, we should rejoice and be glad in you. Well, Lord, there are a lot of things that are happening at this time, as you know, that uh, have changed the way that we live our lives, from the coronavirus, Lord, to the upheaval we see in this country now because of another incident with a police officer. Lord, I pray that um, we will continue to respect the police, especially the body of Christ, Lord, that they are there to serve us, and they do do, they do serve us, and I praise you and thank you for all them that serve. I pray that we will continue to just realize that they're not there, Lord, to try to hinder us or hurt us, that they're there to serve those that they were took the oath to serve. And yes, Lord, as you know, they're, we're all sinners. We all need your grace, Lord. And what happened in Minneapolis was nothing less than sin. But Lord, I lift up that city to you now, as many others have, that you will continue to just be with the churches in that city, give them a vision of how they can minister to that city at this time so your gospel will go forth. Lord, we just um, commit that whole city into your hands and we commit this whole country into your hands, Lord. We don't know what's going to happen in November in this country, as I'll talk about later in my sermon, Lord, but I know that whoever you put in the White House all the way down to the local mayor is who you want there and that is the best thing for your kingdom to go forth. And I pray that we will remember that. And I thank you for the privilege that we have here in this country to even vote. Lord, I think it's our duty to vote based on what your word says. And you've given us the privilege to vote. And I thank you for that. That we can submit to our government by voting for our government. And I thank you for that privilege you have given in this country. Lord, again, I just as it's been mentioned, I praise you that uh, we celebrate this day that... Uh, Many, about 2,000 years ago, you did send your spirit to indwell in those that believe in you. And what an amazing thing that is. Your spirit has set us apart for your use. You have sanctified us with your spirit, and you continue to sanctify us with your spirit. But Lord, as we continue on in this service, I pray that all the glory, all the glory be for you. That you will be the one that is lifted up at this time through the proclamation of your word, through the sermon, to the singing we will do at the end. Lord, I just continue to pray for those that um, still feel uncomfortable to meet at this local body. I pray for those that may be watching us online week from week, that may live close, that you will draw them in so we can meet them. That you would just do the work in them as only you can do through your word going forth through the internet. Lord, for all those people that may still be struggling with jobs and finances, and I pray for all those people, Lord, to let us, when we see those people, help those people in their needs, absolutely, but let us not be ashamed of the gospel, because one day, we're all going to meet you face to face. I pray that your gospel will go forth from this local body, because we desire to see others come into your kingdom, so that you will get more glory in their praise. It's all about you. And help me now as I proclaim the message to those watching online and also to the people that are here. And I thank you again for this local body, even though we are split services right now. We are one in you. I pray for the day we can get back together when it's your timing and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Our sermon series is still in the first book of Corinthians, as many of you know, as all of you know probably by now. We actually, Lord willing, finishing chapter 3. We'll be finishing chapter 3. The verses for the sermon today are 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 23. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 23. If you are able, will you please stand to honor the word of the Lord. No one should deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so, he can, so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise 
are meaningless. So no one should boast in human leaders, for everything is yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. Everything is yours and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. You may be seated. The title of this sermon today is Correct View. Correct View. The older I get, the more I'm realizing that my eyes are not getting any better. And if I did not have my contacts in right now, I couldn't see any of you. I can barely see the fingers if I hold out my hand. But I caught myself the other morning when I was getting out of bed. I looked at our window and our bathroom. And at first glance, when I looked at it, it's like, oh man, that's a big spider at the top of that window. I was like, I better get something and get that spider. But then after my eyes had time to refocus and I looked again, it was no insect at all. It was just a shadow based on how the window was built. Just a shadow based on how the window was built. This may be true, that our bodies, brothers and sisters, are withering away, as scripture says. But this should not be true of our walk with Christ. This should not be true with our walk with Christ. As we grow in Him, we should be getting a clearer picture of who He is. A clearer picture of who we are. And as I just mentioned, as 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. As we looked at last week, we need to be renewed in our minds and our thinking. The way that we actually view things is what that verse pertains to. The way that we actually view things. An example in my own life, I remember, I don't even think I was saved yet, and I always used to hear, this was way back, when the abortion debate was not quite to where it is now, and the big debate was, Okay, abortion is wrong, but you got to have the three exceptions. The rape, the mother's health, and I can't even think of the other one right now. I didn't write down, but that's okay. They always had the exception clauses. And I always used to like, okay, I can agree with that. But God, God renewed my mind even in that. God renewed my mind even in that. Because now, that is a life. No matter if it's a day old, a heartbeat, it happened by rape, which is a horrible circumstance, a horrible circumstance, but two wrongs, as they say, do not make a right. So our picture, our minds continually need to be renewed until the day we see him face to face. And that has to happen because our old sinful nature, our old sinful nature still remains in us, even as Jesus has set us free from the power that sin has over us. He has set us free from the power that sin has over us. Just last week, and this is a point in my life that I realized last week I had to deal with some roots. Just last week I was talking to someone that was telling me how God had opened their eyes. They had watched something by another biblically solid teacher and realized that they were wrong in how they viewed government and how submitting to government was a good thing. And they were telling me all these things and I just sat there listening to him. We were talking on the phone and I started getting angry. Not mad, like I wanted to go hit somebody, but I started getting upset because he's like, oh yeah, he talked about this. And I was like, oh yeah, that was in this sermon. And he said, oh yeah, he talked about this. And I was like, yeah, that was in that sermon that I preached. And he said, he talked about this, this, and this. I'm like, was he even listening to what I was saying? Oh, I, I could catch myself getting mad, knew it was wrong, getting upset. But this, I mean, I just preached through this like a couple weeks before. Who gives the growth? God gives the growth. God gives the growth. I realized that I needed to deal with myself and my mind and that sin in me was still deep and I needed to deal with that. And it doesn't matter 
where it comes. But what is that? Ultimately, that is my selfishness. Ultimately, that is my selfishness. And that, again, is what Paul is dealing with here in the book of Corinthians. I confess my selfishness to God. By His grace, He gave me the joy that I should have had when this person came to me and said, Hey, I've been seeing this. I see it differently now. Well, I should have been just excited to begin with when they told me that. And then I thank God that we are 1 Corinthians because God used 1 Corinthians chapter 3 to me, pointed out to me the root of my sin, my selfishness. I need to be reminded in a practical way that God is the one that gives the growth. So my vision needs to become clearer on that. In that, I also realized that how much of my experience of living in the United States of America has influenced me. How much I am still influenced by the culture of this country. How easy it is to be pressed into the mold of the culture we live in, into the mold of this world, if we're not careful to renew our minds and deal with things that we need to be deal dealt with in our lives. Why? Because what is the culture of the United States? It is me-centered. It is me-centered. We live in the greatest country that's ever been on the face of the earth, some say, but we are a very me-centered country. I remember Pastor Kirk telling me early on when we first started coming here, he said, it is very easy for small town churches to have the same mentality of God as they do with their politics. What do I mean by that? What did he mean by that? Just think of it this way. We live in a rural part of this country, which is very self-sufficient, very self-sufficient. Most of us want small government, be left alone to live our lives. That can carry over into our view of God. When do we want God? When do we want the government to step in? When we need help. When we need help. This, is, this self reliance, which is a good thing, by the way, can turn into pride very easily. And what is pride? It is saying to God, that you know better than him. That you know better than him. That you've got this figured out. You don't need anything. When the big stuff hits, I'll give you a call. This is what Paul is rebuking and addressing. This is the mentality, honestly, of all of mankind. It is a look at me mentality. Look what I have done. Look at the club I belong to. Look what my family does. Jen and I have been talking lately about Facebook which is a means that God is using to spread his word. And please don't misunderstand this statement. I use Facebook. I know that God is using this technology. Just as in the past, he used the Roman road system for the spread of the gospel. He used a printing press when it came out for the spread of the gospel. And I just found out within the last couple weeks, through a video I got to watch, he used shortwave radio on a mountain in Ecuador to spread the gospel. Shortwave radio on a mountain in Ecuador. It's still there today. HCJB was started in 1931 by a missionary. In its heyday, this radio, they put it there for a reason, this shortwave towers on top of the Andes Mountain in Ecuador, right outside of Quito, reached 80% of the surface of the planet. 80% of the surface of the planet, shortwave radio, on a mountain in Ecuador. 35 different languages were proclaimed. It got behind the Iron Curtain of Russia to the church there, and it was edified. And this just blew me away, because I thought when I saw the title of the video we were about to watch, it said Germany and Ecuador. I'm like, all right, we're going to the Reformation with Luther and all them, and yeah. And what do we think of when we think of Ecuador? Jim Elliot. Killed by natives in the jungle. Didn't even talk about Jim Elliot. It was an amazing thing. And they're still broadcasting from this radio station in Ecuador. So God uses means, and He's using Facebook for this mean. But her and I were just talking 
like this meme that he is using now Facebook can very easily turn into a look at me mentality a look at me mentality there are some people that live their lives through Facebook show us everything to do every day what they're doing how they're posting and then I've seen responses by others like oh I'm so jealous of your life I wish I could be doing that it's like what are we doing what are we doing Again, I'm not saying don't use Facebook. But just, why are you posting things on Facebook? Ask yourself that. Is it for His glory? Or is it so people will say, look at me? And this is what we see before us in this passage today. This passage is Paul's forceful summary of his arguments that he started in verse 118. For chapter 1, verse 18. This is his forceful summary of everything he's done since 118, as one com commentator noted. He has pointed out to the Corinthians, in his summary statements, which are two Old Testament quotes, by the way, you better be careful not to think too highly of yourself. In fact, you need to be thinking less of yourself and more of him. Charles Hodge said it like this, when commenting on these verses. Let him, us, renounce his own wisdom in order that he may receive the wisdom of God. We must empty, we must be empty in order to be filled. We must renounce our own righteousness in order to be clothed in his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. We must renounce our own strength in order to be made strong in him. We must renounce our own wisdom in order to be truly wise. Hodge goes on to say that we must renounce all that is in us, simply because those things we value in our sinfulness, that we value our sinfulness, are ourselves. Ourselves are sinful. A truly, a, are truly worthless, the things that we value which are sinful, are truly worthless in the economy of God. It is simply because they are, in fact, worthless, and we are called upon to regard them as such. Look at verse 18. No one should deceive himself. No one should deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he can become wise. It is easy to be caught up in thinking that we are wise. As I was reminded this week, this root goes deep. This root goes deep in us, and it is watered. It is watered by a culture that we live in today, as I have stated. The question of how do I look to those around us is the society we live in. How do we keep up with the Joneses? How do I look to my neighbor? How do I look to this? What car am I driving? What am I wise? What am I wise in? Myself or God? These are questions each of us will have to answer for ourselves. And God will deal with you where you're at as he dealt with me where I was at. But let us remember this. Let us remember this. Look at verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God since it is written. And here's his two statements. His summary of everything he's been dealing with said, Chapter 1, verse 18. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, he states another passage. And the Lord knows the reason, reasons of the wise are meaningless. So there are the two Old Testament quotes. There are the two Old Testament quotes. And on a quick side note, no matter what version of the Bible you may be using, learn how to recognize when passages are quoted from the Old Testament. When you're in the New Testament. An example, one reason I like the New Holman Christian Standard Version, is all their Old Testament passages are in bold. If they quote from the Old Testament, all their passages are in bold. And it is a translation. It's not a paraphrase. I believe it's now just called the Christian Standard Bible. But it's put out by Holman, and I would recommend it to anybody. And when you see them, do some digging. If you know this is the quote from the Old Testament, do some digging to see the context that they're quoting from. It will help you understand the Old Testament, and it will help you understand the passages that you may be studying. I just recently got 
from the T4G bookstore, a new study guide, and basically it is a commentary, and all the Old Testament quotes in the New Testament, which I love already. So if I see a quote in the New Testament, I can go to this commentary and they say, okay, this is what they quoted it from, which will be noted in a good Bible also, by the way. This was what the flow of the passage was in the Old Testament, what they were thinking when they were quoted it, and it helps you understand the Old Testament more, what God was saying, and why the authors of the New Testament quoted it. And remember, they quoted it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at Paul's first quote from the Old Testament we have here. It is actually from Job 5.13. It is from Job 5.13. And Paul is using two quotes as his final thrust, his summary statement of everything, again, that he's been saying for almost three chapters. And the flow of thought from Job 5.8 to 5.16 is this. It depicts God as a great, unsearchable, and marvelous. It depicts God as great, unsearchable, and marvelous. He is the one that does great and marvelous things. It sets up an opposition between the wise and the poor, also in this passage. The wise would be those that think of themselves highly, and the poor would be those that do not think of themselves highly. They think of themselves as nothing. Those that realize their value comes from God, that their wisdom comes from God. The theme of this passage in Job is that God will deliver those who consider themselves poor over the ones that consider themselves wise. And this is again what Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. Remember how Jesus said it in his Sermon on the Mount, the poor in spirit are blessed. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And that poor in spirit is not one that just goes around woe is me all the time. It is one that realizes that there is nothing good in them and needs someone else for their salvation. Someone else other than themselves to be good. So, all of this again is a focus shift that Paul is using here. If you truly want to become wise, if you truly want to become wise, you must become a fool in the world's standards, in the ways the world views things. Ways the world views things. I remember talking to somebody recently in this church that they realized when God got a hold of them and their lives started to change, they started to realize that all their old friends just started to disappear. They started to lose all their old friends. Why? Because they were become, getting the wisdom of God, which was foolishness to their unsaved friends, which is foolishness to their unsaved friends. When a person renews their mind and puts off the old way of thinking, that will lead to a life of different actions and priorities. It is almost like Paul, at this point in this letter, is screaming to the Corinthians, do not be self-deceived. If you think you are wise in this world, you have become fools. So that you will be wise, you must become fools. You must become fools so that you'll be wise in God's wisdom. And that's the only wisdom that is worth anything. Why do I say Paul is screaming this? I don't mean in a literal sense. But he gives two accounts from the Old Testament to defend this point. As we know in Jewish culture, what did it take to convict somebody of a wrongdoing? Two witnesses. Two true witnesses that have witnessed the event. I don't think it's by accident that Paul is grabbing two witnesses, if you will, from the Old Testament to put the clincher on this point. So let's look at the other one. Let's look at the other one, which is from Psalm 9411. Psalm 9411. The Lord knows the reasonings of the wise are meaningless. That is Paul's other quote he uses from the Old Testament as this climax to defend what he's been saying for almost three chapters. Nine, Psalm 94 stresses this, stresses this, that in spite of the manipulative and corruptive leadership by those in authority, the schemes of these human persons fail because of their best thinkers, because their best thinkers are fallible. 
The psalm also promises that blessing awaits those who depend on God. He will not abandon them, but rather will teach them and aid them in their time of need. After that, after Paul's two defenses at this time in the Old Testament, what do we see? What's his next line? So, no one should boast in human leaders. He gives the two witnesses from the Old Testament. He said, if you don't believe me, here's the written word. Because remember, when Paul was writing this book, at that time, within church history, it was not scripture yet. So he is using scripture, God's word, the Old Testament, to say, here's my climax, here's my defense. No one should boast in human leaders. I just showed you why. It's almost like he's asking, how can one boast in human leaders? How can one boast in the wisdom of the world? Even if that leader is good and godly, he's saying that leaders should not be boasted in. Does this mean we should not honor leaders? No. But what is the difference between honoring leaders and boasting in leaders? I think Hodge says it well when he says, when he's quoting on verse, commenting on verse 21. To glory in a person or a thing is to trust in him, or it is as a ground of confidence, or as a source of honor or blessedness. Do we trust in our human leaders, or do we honor them for what they have done in God? We are living this right now, I believe, in our culture. We are living this right now in our culture. First, let me say, as this illustration is coming out, I believe we may be facing the most important election this country has ever seen in November. From the national level all the way down to the local level. And honestly, your local officials may be even more important than the national ones. So I would encourage you all to vote. All to vote. And I believe it's our biblical responsibility to vote. We are living in a time of history where different political choices is like choosing from night and day. It is night and day now. Their platforms are on two opposite spectrums. One platform wants to protect life and liberty, the other wants to destroy them and take away them. So I pray that you will do your civic duty, that which God has given you, and take it seriously this November. But there are some other things that concern me in all of this. Some other things that concern me, and I will mention one. We are seeing this even within the body of Christ. That there are those that think our current president is the one that's going to turn everything around. They are not honoring him as the president. They are boasting in him as the president. Believers are boasting in the president as if they are actually associated with him, that which puts them in with that crowd. This is what happened. This is what was happening in Corinth within the church also. They were boasting in their leaders, not honoring their leaders. Listen to Hodge again. To glory in any person or thing is to trust in him or it as the ground of confidence, or as a source of honor or blessedness. It is to regard ourselves blessed because of our relationship to it. Listen to what Hodge also says later on in his commentary on these verses. I think this says it well. The greatest men of the world, kings, statesmen, and heroes, ministers, Individual believers, unbelievers, live or die just as best sub subserves to the interest of Christ's kingdom. To the interest of Christ's kingdom. So this is it. If God keeps our current president for four more years, it is because that will be the best thing for the advancement of the gospel. The advancement of his kingdom. If God gives us another president for the next four years, it is because that will be the best thing for the advancement of his kingdom. It all boils down to what will give God the most glory. Why did he raise up Pharaoh? Romans 9, 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, 
so that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. How was Pharaoh's, what was Pharaoh's purpose? God used him to get glory. Think about what happened. Read the story. So those of us, and I'm not saying it's anyone here, but it may be some online or others, that think our current president is something to boast in, we are living by the wisdom of the world. And listen to Calvin's definition of worldly wisdom. For the wisdom of the world is this, if we reckon ourselves sufficient of ourselves for taking counsel as to all matters. If we reckon ourselves sufficient of ourselves for taking counsel to all matters. Think back to Peter. We looked at him the last couple weeks when he rebuked Jesus. When Jesus started to explain to him, Yes, Peter, you are right. I am the Messiah. God has revealed that to you. Then Jesus said, Okay, as the Messiah, we're going back to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed by the worst possible death of that time. So Peter takes him aside, and maybe it's because where they're at, maybe Peter's thinking, okay, maybe this accessory Philippi did get you, Jesus. Maybe we shouldn't be here. It's a pretty evil place, and maybe you're just not thinking right right now. But you're not going to suffer. The Messiah is not going to suffer. Where is that wisdom coming from that Peter did that to rebuke Jesus? Where is that wisdom coming from? And what did Jesus say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Because you are not thinking about God's concern, but man's. You are not thinking about God's concern, but man's. This. What is again Paul's two statements? He catches the wise in their craftiness. And the Lord knows the reasoning of the wise are meaningless. But God doesn't leave us there in this passage, which is an amazing thing. And he could have. He could have said, my wisdom is the best. Here's the example from the Old Testament. But Paul just lays out something that is so beautiful at the end of this. I hope you guys just soak this in. God could have stopped at the verses that I just read. And he would have been rightly so to do so in his sovereignty and in his wisdom. But look what he says next. Look what he says next. Again, verse 21, I'll start. So no one should boast in human leaders. For everything is yours. For everything is yours. Why? Can you just see Paul? If he was there in person, he'd probably be like, why are you boasting in me? What did I give you? Even Paul himself was given to the Corinthians by God. Who's the one that sent Paul into Corinth? Who's the one? God put the Apostle Paul in Corinth. God also chose the Apostle Paul to write 28% of our New Testament. God chose him. We are just to have that proper view of who he is as ourselves, as 18 through 20 tells us. We are if you think too highly of yourself, <laughs> just read 18 to 20 again. Don't think highly of yourself. We need to have a proper view of those that God has raised up for his purposes. Even those within the church. Even those within the church. And we've had a lot of heroes of the faith from within 2,000 years. Just, I mean, just, what is our view of Paul? What is our view of Peter? What is our view of Luther? Calvin? Spurgeon, Knox, Sproul, Bauckham, MacArthur, Hodge, Piper, Moeller, Ham, Duncan, etc., etc., etc. We should honor these men. Yes, but we should not boast in them. We should not boast in them. All these men did, faithful men of the past and women of the past, pointed to Christ. They were faithful servants and they pointed to Christ. Pointed to Christ. And again, look what we get. Everything is already ours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, given by God, all those people. Then where else does he go in this? Where else does he go in this? We go to the world. 
Do you realize the world is yours at this very moment? Do you ever think about that? It's not the new heaven and new earth yet, but you are co-heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself testifies, together with our spirit, that we are God's children, and of God's children also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. How can we be boasting in human leaders? Do you see what Paul is doing here? He's like, how? Why are you guys even saying that? Where did I come from? We've talked about that in the past. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 5, 5. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. God has made those that believe in Christ co-heirs with Christ. The earth is already ours. The world is ours. You've also been given life. This life is referring here, that he talks about, is referring more so to your spiritual life, your eternal life. You have eternal life with God at this very moment. This very moment. We just talked about Pentecost, the Spirit coming to enjoy in us. It's oath that's done. If you're a believer in Christ, you have His Spirit living in you right now, which seals the deal for your eternal life as Ephesians chapter 1 would say. Eternal life with God. Let that soak in. Eternal life with God. Even death is yours. The greatest enemy of mankind has been overcome. Christ conquered death. And those that have Him are in him also have conquered death. Your death will usher you into the very presence of God. Your death will usher you into the very presence of God. You will behold the lamb that was slain. You will behold your very Savior face to face. What did Paul say when he was waiting when he wrote the book of Philippians, as he was waiting to meet the most powerful man in the world at that time that would decide his fate, he wrote these words. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. Now if I live in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which I should choose. I am pressured by both. I have desired to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, which is far better, well, Paul knew even if a guy kept him on earth for a little bit longer, it was for a reason, for a reason to serve him. Every time, you guys think about this, this also blows me away every time. Every time I read the story of Lazarus, right? He's been dead for three to four days. Lazarus is in the presence of God. Do you think the conversation may have wanted something like this? I've often wondered. He's like, all right, God, I'll go back. <laughs> because I know you want me to go back. But how long are you going to keep me back there? <laughs> I mean, Lazarus died twice. I've often now wondered if he asked God that. Not in a bad way. Just he knew that it was God's will to go back. I mean, he had to know it was coming. I don't think they put him in a closet somewhere and said, okay, just hold him over here. And, but it's like, I'll go back. But when am I coming back here? What do we see next? What do we see next after your death? I mean, just again, think about your death though. When your death happens, you will be able to see an unveiled glory of him. An unveiled glory of the one that died for you. The next thing Paul mentions in his list is that we will, all things are ours, is that we, the things we experience at this present time, the things that we experience at this present time are even a gift. They're even a gift from God by His grace. Everything that we experience in this life, whether good, the bad, the pleasant, the painful, the joys, the disappointments, the health, the illness, 
It's all conforming us to what? The image of Christ. It's all conforming us to the image of Christ. We know this verse. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those that have been saved. Those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together to that. All things work together for our good. And last week in Sunday school class, Andy was mentioned as he was studying for class. And the part of the book we were in was the example of Christ, the life that he had to live. And it really hit Andy that he was saying, Jesus was the most beautiful human that ever lived. And he didn't mean that in the sense of his physical appearance, but he was what Adam was supposed to be. Always kind, always joyful, always compassionate. He was the most beautiful human that ever lived. He would be the guy that you wanted to be your next door neighbor. Just think about that. The perfect, unsinning human as your neighbor. He was the most beautiful human that ever lived. So everything that God puts in our life to conform us to that image is a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. Then he goes on to things to come. This refers again to heavenly blessings that await you and me on our day. It's not so much referring to future things in this life. Again, it's referring to future blessings that we will have in heaven. And just in case Paul misses something, just in case he misses something, how does he end it? Everything is yours. Everything is yours. And all this was given to us because we belong to Christ. He paid it all for us to receive all of that. And again, that's what Paul's saying here. He's like, how can you be boasted in anybody? When Jesus is the Lord. Even back when, I believe it's chapter 1, when Paul goes, was I, did I baptize you? Was I crucified for you? I mean, Paul could have kept saying anything. Why are you looking at me? Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Why are you even thinking about boasting in me? All this, everything is ours. And again, it was given to us because we belong to Christ. Jesus is our Lord. He is the one that we are going to boast in. We will boast in Him if He is our Lord, if we are in Him. And if we boast in Him, we will not have divisions over human leaders. We will not have divisions within churches. Everything that we have is a gift that God has given us to those, again, who are in Christ. And we belong to Christ, and who does Christ belong to? Christ belongs to God. Christ belongs to the Father. The creator of the universe is your Lord. He is your master. And you belong to Him. You belong to Him. And He belongs to God. John 17, 9 and 10. I pray for them. This is Jesus. This is his true prayer. This is the prayer. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those who have given me. Because they are yours. Everything I have is yours. Everything you have is mine. And I have been glorified in them. And later on, verses 21 and 23, he says this. This is in John 17, by the way. May all they be, may all of them be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. May they also be one in ours. I think the greatest summary statement of this whole passage is by John MacArthur, and I will read it. He said it like this. The greatest possible motivation for maintaining the, the unity of the Spirit and for avoiding church division is knowing that we belong to Christ and that Christ belongs to God. Because we all belong to Him, we all belong to each other. There is one body, one faith, one baptism. 
Father, again, I just praise you and thank you for who you are. Lord, I'm amazed at this, the end of this passage, even the beginning of it. Why are we boasting in anything but our human wisdom? You have given us everything because of what you have done. Because you came, you lived that beautiful, perfect life that we could not live. The life that satisfied the obedience that was needed, the human obedience that was needed to glorify the Father. Not only did you live that life that we could not live, you died the death that we deserve. Lord, in your death, you purchased a bride for the Father to give him that he gave you. And the Spirit seals the deal. Lord, help us to boast in you. Lord, help us to share others about you. Tell others about you and your beautifulness. Just by the simple fact that we want others to praise who you are. Yes, we should be concerned about their souls and where they are going. But Lord, let us be fervent to see more people praise you for who you are. Let us go forth and let us boast in you only. For your glory alone. Amen. Oh, how he loves you. seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever.